From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. He is the most infamous gangster alive. After 16 years on the lam, James J. Whitey Bulger was finally tracked down in Santa Monica, California in June 2011. A jaded society questioned whether the FBI even wanted the South Boston crime boss found. The lasting legacy of his relationship with the storied agency is a black eye for the government. The FBI of decades ago not only protected Bulger and his top lieutenant, Stephen the Rifleman Fleming, but look the other way while the gangsters and top echelon informants for the feds committed murder. A groundbreaking new book reveals never before seen details about Whitey's life then and now. Charged in the murders of 19 people, a highly anticipated trial is on the horizon and Bulger's lawyers have said Whitey plans to take the stand in his own defense. The book Whitey Bulger provides deep insight as to what the man who terrorized Boston for decades might say. This week on Newsmakers, Boston Globe reporters and authors of the book Whitey Bulger, Kevin Cullen and Shelley Murphy. Good morning. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the panel, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi and Shelley. Welcome back to the program, uh, Kevin. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us. Having us. Braving sleet and snow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I first want to congratulate both of you on a fantastic book. I devoured it within days, and I've read a lot of books on this topic. This is the authoritative account. So congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. To that, so much has been written about Whitey Bulger. Anybody, it seems, who has had some connection, even a small one, has decided to crank out a book. Um, and I'm wondering if there was anything that you two felt that you uncovered that uh, was new when researching and writing, something that you didn't know about after decades of reporting on it. Shelley? Yeah, well, I think the big thing was tracking down one of his friends who had served time with him in Alcatraz in Atlanta. And, and then this friend shared letters with us that Whitey has been writing to him from jail since his capture. And so for me, seeing Whitey's thoughts, his, you know, getting inside his mind, um, Whitey has this uh, amazing high, high sense of himself. Yeah. Uh, very, you know, strong persecution complex. I mean, he's charged with killing 19 murders, but he's talking about the cold, heartless government, how mean, you know, they've been to his girlfriend. Um, he's talking, you know, saying a lot of things that he, he wants to change sort of what's been written about him. So these letters were written by uh, a guy named, uh, were written to, he exchanged with a guy named Richard Sunday, and that's what you're referring to. Um, how did you come to find this Richard Sunday, and why did he agree to give you the letters? I mean, there's no way that Whitey Bulger would have been thrilled that no. you had them. No, Whitey was very upset that we had them. Um, I tracked Richard down years ago when Whitey was still on the run and Whitey had called um, Richard while he was on the run looking for fake identities and Richard did not help him but I interviewed Richard about 10 years ago and so when Whitey was captured I went back to Richard hoping to talk to him about the early years and you know what Whitey was like when they were in prison together um, and then throughout you know the course of the book um, he started writing to Whitey and then decided to share those letters because he, he still considers Whitey a friend and he's actually very sympathetic to him and felt that these letters really showed another side of him and he knew we had plenty of information about the murders and you know all the various crimes over the years but he wanted us to see another side of Whitey which we really did by looking at these yeah. letters but we also discovered that Whitey had a very low opinion of Mr. Cullen and I. And we will get to that but <laughs> Kevin with the decades that um, you reported on this we should point out you were part of the spotlight team in 1988 that really first outed Whitey in the relationship he had with the FBI so uh, what, was there anything that stood out to you that was new in your reporting and researching on this. And I'll tell you one thing for me, you know, uh, the years on the run, you guys had some great stuff, some insight there. And I know it's been talked about the relationship with the FBI. But to me, the way it was encapsulated in this book, it really showed um, just how deep it was. It wasn't just John Conley, who was, oh, the, who was the face of this, who is now serving time for prison. No. Was that the, the standout to you? Well, you know, there was. This is a multifaceted book. It's not, and when we set out to write it, I think Shelley and I agreed that there had been almost too many books written about Whitey Bulger. But um, we also believed that there wasn't one that captured him as a person as opposed to an image, as opposed to a caricature. People or a ghost. Or, or a ghost, or people describe him as a monster. 
but it couldn't be just pure corruption with the FBI and the Justice Department that kept him out there that long. The guy had to have charisma. He had to have people like him at one level, and we tried to find that. But in, in terms of the thing that really crystallized for me as we did this process, and I think you see it's an overarching arc in the book, is that Whitey Bulger, from a very young age, was very consciously building an image. And the image was the benevolent gangster, the good guy, the good bad guy. Mm -hmm. And this literally goes back to when he was a teenager and he was tailgating and stealing things off the back of trucks. And, you know, he grew up in a housing project in South Boston, the first housing project in New England. And by the time he was a teenager, in a very poor circumstances, he's driving around in a car. What does he do with the car? He stops the car and picks up the old ladies who are walking home with the groceries. And, and then obviously everybody in the neighborhood knew he was a hood. But, you know, they'd say, oh, but he's a nice guy because he always stops and pisses. Does that image still exist? Mrs. Ma well, no, Does I think it it's shattered? shattered. And I think more than anything, Shelley and I really went to great pains to show that there's this guy that, you know, like I said, young guy, I'm a good, bad guy. Guy that's involved in criminal activity and turning on all his friends and competitors. I'm not an informer. And then you get up to the very end of the book with the letters that Shelley got, in which Whitey says, I would die for the woman I love. I would offer myself up for execution, which is a really romantic and noble thing for a criminal to do. But you know what? If he really cared about Kathy Gregg, his companion, and wanted to save her from an eight year sentence, all he had to do was tell her, Give me up. I'm going to die in prison anyway. Tell the feds anything they want, and they'll let you go. But he didn't do that. Mm. One of the uh, great things about the book, too, is how it tells the story of a place into time, South Boston throughout the 20th century, and even further back, the ethnic, economic, political factors that shaped his world. I'm wondering, Kevin, I know you really enjoyed working on that part of the book. How much was he himself, and then his circumstances and his rise, a product of Southie and what South Boston is? I think it's a big part of the story. Shelley, uh, Shelley and I tried to assess whether, are there other parts in the country? Could this have happened in North Philly? Could it happen in Hell's Kitchen? Could have happened up on Atwell's Avenue. I don't know. But I mean, what we do know that South Boston was a unique place. And it was a place where, you know, there was a overweening sense of loyalty. This goes back to the Irish ethos of the neighborhood. Now, it wasn't all Irish. In fact, you know, there were a lot of Lithuanians, Poles, Italians. But the, the ethos of the neighborhood was Irish. And with, built into that is this incredible sense of loyalty, that loyalty means all to your family, to your friends, to your neighborhood, to your neighbors. And Whitey was able to exploit that because he got an FBI agent from the same hood, from the neighborhood, who ended up making him you know, an informant and protecting him. And, 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 and the only reason that happened then is because at that time in, in gangland history, the national policy of the FBI was to take out La Cosa Nostra. They didn't care about the Irish guys. Mm -hmm. The problem with the national policy, it does not take into account regional differences. Mm -hmm. And in Boston, as you guys know, the Irish guys were killing everybody. <laughs> right. You know, the Italians were a little more organized because they, the, they had the structure of La Cosa Nostra, but the, the Irish guys were killing people left and right. So the FBI makes this real Faustian deal with a bad Irish gangster. And it could only, I think it could only happen, in, in, and then obviously the other dynamic of it is that the big, powerful Irish gangster in Boston just happens to be the brother of the big, powerful Irish politician who ends Boston. up being the president of Massachusetts. You guys know the Showtime Senate. show Brotherhood was set here, but it was actually it was set here in Providence, but it was actually based on Whitey and, <laughs> and, and, and That's one of the things that in the book you uh, write yes. that he loved that show, that's but one thought of his one of his... thought the guy was too violent. Yeah, he said, violent guy. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. And that was a character based on, on right. uh, Whitey Bulger, loosely. Right. All right, back to that relationship with the FBI. Uh, one of the new, and I, I just call it a head shaker, one of the new elements that I found was the book talks about a shipment of C4 explosives Whitey sent to the IRA. You write that he obtained the explosives from an FBI agent. Uh, I hadn't seen that before. How did, uh, talk about no, that we, a little bit. No, we found that in a, um, a report that when um, Steve Flemmy was debriefed by investigators about FBI corruption, he told them that they had received C4 explosives from this FBI agent, John Newton. Um, and John Newton had, has never been charged with anything. And so I, I interviewed him on the telephone and he said absolutely positively not true, didn't happen, um, would not have had access to those kinds of explosives. Um, Flemmy claimed that he, he got them at um, Fort Devens while training there. Um, and John Newton says, not true, never happened. But the surprising thing to me, he was very surprised when I called him and I said, well, certainly you've been questioned about this. 
And he said, no, never, that he had never been questioned by the FBI or any other law enforcement agency. Why do you think it was that we have H. Paul Rico died waiting to, I should point out that he was a, another FBI agent. He, he helped incite an, a, a turf war early on between two Irish gangs um, down there, strong connections to Whitey Bulger. Uh, you had uh, John Morris, who was a supervisor to John Conley, and he, he uh, escaped prison time because he cooperated with the government. Really, John Connolly is the only guy Absolutely. that took a fall on, uh, on this one. Why, why is that and how many people got away with it? Well, certainly from the very beginning, the FBI and overall the Justice Department, their narrative has been about damage limitation. They want you to believe that it's one corrupt agent. Bad apple. Bad apple. We, oh, we made a mistake. We had the hometown guy work on the hometown wise guy. We shouldn't have done that. And he had a corrupt supervisor, so we got away with it. That's baloney. That's not the truth. It you was mentioned systemic. Because, I mean, John, John Conley was doing what Paul Rico was doing in the 60s. Yeah. They were playing God. They were determining which gang would emerge. They, it, they were pulling strings. And what we really try to establish in the book is that this, the corruption went all the way to headquarters. We have scenes in the book in which Whitey and Stevie were implicated in four murders in the early 1980s. And there's this big meeting at headquarters down the at FBI headquarters down in Washington. And it, you would think, my God, these guys are there are our informants, and they're implicated in these murders. We got to close them right away. That is what happened in Washington. They said these guys are important assets. Mm. That's how they looked at it. It's like it's like a bad Jason Bourne movie. <laughs> They're talking about assets as opposed to murder. And even uh, you know, for pe even for people at home who might not be interested in organized crime, this there are huge public policy questions here. How do you keep a big, powerful, respected institution like the Justice Department from going so far off the rails as we saw here for for decades? I mean, do you think could this happen again? Could the FBI I absolutely get think it could happen Rossetti? again. And we have done stories more recently about a fellow named Steve Rossetti. Who is actually Mark, 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 Rossetti. Mark, Mark Rossetti, who has a brother named Steve Rossetti. That's another story. But anyway, <laughs> Mark, Mark Rossetti, you know, it has been used was used as an FBI informant as recently as two years ago. In fact, his handler was part of this same crew that was corrupted by Bulger, and he, he was he was used even though he was a, a, a suspect in at least six murders. And the state police like. The guys that went after Whitey Balls, the Massachusetts State Police, took Rossetti off the street, even, and they knew that he was working for the FBI. They gave the FBI a chance to admit to it before they targeted him. FBI said, oh, no, no, he's not our guy. As soon as the state police wire goes up, Rossetti's on there talking to his FBI handler. Mm -hmm. So they have not learned. And I think if, when you read this book, I think one of the things Shelley and I hope will come out of it, it wasn't about bad apples. It's about institutional corruption. Well, that, and that tell you, that's th this. Uh, we have to go to a break, but that that talks about the difficulty of dealing with informants. I mean, you're you're absolutely. in the sewer here, and 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 a lot of times that that can come back. So I don't know if, if there is any solution in when you're going to deal with criminals. There's always going to be a, a seedy element to it. But clearly, this went off the rails. I have to go to a break. So mm -hmm. in 30 seconds, uh, I answer this question, and then and then we'll come back. But. Uh, Bulger was real nervous when they caught Osama bin Laden. Why? No, that's right, because he knew that he was, he was the, they had a, a, a $2 million reward for his capture, the most of any other fugitive, you know, a, a domestic fugitive. And so he felt that the pressure was going to turn to him, that it would probably free up more resources, and it did. And that, in the end, was, uh, he, if I read in the book, if I remember from the book, he really hunkered down at that he point. He absolutely did. He stopped going out so much. He was nervous. He started laying low. And his girlfriend started telling people that noticed, you know, where is he, uh, that he was suffering from early Alzheimer's. He wasn't <laughs> feeling well to try to explain why he wasn't out and about as much as he had been. You can say a lot about him, but he wasn't stupid, I well, suppose. I'd, I'd say that Whitey had Irish Alzheimer's and that he forgot everything but grudges. <laughs> All right, the book <laughs> is Whitey Bulger. The authors are Kevin Cullen and Shelley Murphy. And when we come back, uh, we talked to Kevin a little bit about a threat he received when he first started writing and outing uh, Whitey Bulger as an FBI informant. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi, and our guests this week are Boston Globe reporters and authors of the new book, Whitey Bulger. We have Kevin Cullen and Shelley Murphy. Um, Reading through this book, it's clear that Whitey Bulger doesn't like either of you too much. And let me just read a couple of passages. Um, you wrote in here, 
from a letter. He said he hates Shelley Murphy from writing stories about him and his brother Bill, Bill Bulger, the former Senate president. He also considers her a traitor. Murphy grew up in Dorchester, went to South Boston High School, and was herself uh, caught up in the busing crisis. Cullen is another, quote, quote, lowlife who lied about my family and me. Um, Kevin, you lived in South Boston at the time, and uh, as I said going to a break, you were part of the 1988 Spotlight team that first exposed the relationship. You got a pretty threatening phone call when that story was about to go to print. Talk about that. Yeah, I got a, two months before we went to, it was a four-part series about the relationship between the brothers and all that. Uh, about two months before we went to print with that story, I got a call from an agent named Tom Daly who said that he understood what we were going to do. He said, I know you're going to say that he's an informant. That's not true. And if you do print that, uh, Whitey will not live with that. And he would think nothing of clipping you, especially you, Kevin. You lived there. Uh, I was seen as the most vulnerable person on the team at the time because I lived in South Boston. So, um, you know, we had a big huddle. We decided that if there was a real, f uh, if the FBI really thought my life was in danger, there would have been a much more f formal notification. But you to think be, based <laughs> on no, seriously? Be, no, I know. I don't, like I said, I didn't trust any of them anyway because I knew they were in the tank with Bulger. But so, but we went to honest cops, the state cops, Bobby Long, Massachusetts State Police. First guy I called. Bobby, I just got this call. We went to DE agents because we knew they would take going after Bulger, honestly. I talked to Frank DeWan, a Boston police cop, a police officer that Shelley and I know and really trust. So we put that on record, and then before the series moved uh, appeared, my wife and I moved out of town. But it's so, it's so Boston. Yeah. We moved to Cambridge. It's <laughs> right. like, yeah, like yeah. four miles now away. Now you're like getting a passport eight, to get into eight, Cambridge. They'll, they'll, come to they'll Cambridge. never go to Cambridge. They'll never find us in Harvard Square. You know, but reporters don't like to talk about <laughs> threats they've received. Uh, they don't like to talk about it publicly. Uh, we don't like inserting ourselves into stories at no. all. Um, did you think about not adding that one to the book? And in the end, why did you think it was important to do so? No. Um, well, I, I, the funny thing is we didn't mention it. I didn't mention it until 1997 after the, uh, Judge Wolf forced the FBI to admit it, that he was an informant. They denied it. We reported in 1988. They denied it for a decade. Mm -hmm. So I put it in a story in context, buried in the story that this, this threat happened. And then the FBI actually decided to follow up on that uh, report that was in the Boston Globe. They called me about a year after it appeared in the Boston Globe. <laughs> right on and top the agent it. who called me, I was sitting in a bar with an IRA man in Belfast, and the agent said, we really want to get to the bottom of this. And I looked at the phone, oh, really? Maybe you might have wanted to call me about a year ago, John. Click. And that was it. That was it. Okay. Um, I know down here in Providence, uh, Tim has talked briefly with Luigi Baby Shack's monocular reputed former boss. Have either of you ever talked to Whitey? I made an attempt. Yeah. I walked into the liquor store. It would have been 85-ish, and um, I, I, he was behind the counter. I thought there'd be more people, and it was just him. When I walked in there, I said, Mr. Bulger, I'm Kevin Cullen from the Boston Globe. I, you know, I know this is awkward. I'd really like to have a conversation. <laughs> this is broadcast TV, by the way, so no swears. I'm not, okay. <laughs> well, I'll just, what I'll say is the only thing he said to me was, he suggested I do something that was anatomically impossible. <laughs> well, we did try to um, talk to him for this book. I mean, we wrote repeatedly to him at the Plymouth jail, and he did not respond to our letters at all. And he did respond to his friend that he wants to tell his story his way. And I think he, you know, he started writing his own memoirs. And the version that he wants to put out there is that he was not an FBI informant, yeah. even though we've seen his pretty hefty FBI informant file. And he also wants to refute the fact that he's, you know, killed two women, um, or he claims he didn't. The two of the victims. Of the so 19 focused victims. on his image, all through very the concerned because Absolutely. reputation is everything. And as Kevin and I have talked uh, uh, about this, that you know, in, in the Irish culture, there's really nothing worse you can be than a rat. And mm -hmm. so he's determined to, you know, he wants to refute that. He he has already resigned himself to the fact that he'll probably die behind bars, but. He plans to go down fighting, and that's one of the things he wants to try to change. Um, as you put in the book, uh, quote, there's nothing worse in the Irish consciousness than being a snitch. Kevin, you wrote a column last month uh, mm -hmm. where you hammered Whitey's lawyer for claiming Bulger wasn't, quote, a rat. I want to talk about that because... Um, it just for devil, the devil's advocate, from the book, his handler, John Connolly, would inflate his value, attributing mm -hmm. stuff to Stephen Fleming. 
Uh, Bolger gave them false information to his benefit. So how is that being a rat then? Wasn't he using the FBI for his own benefit? Well, no question, but I mean, as, as Shelly mentioned, we, we went through his file. There are things in the file that only Whitey could know. John Connolly would not have known this stuff about these minor league gang guys in Southeast. So I mean, the idea that he didn't give information to, to um, John Connolly, to me, I find that intellectually insulting. And I suggest that. When you write, but, but, okay, I'm saying just Jimmy Whitey is very good at sophistry. And what he would tell you is that, you know what, I never gave them anything. Nobody went to jail on my, and those were in the letters. He says it like that. Nobody, not one person went to prison based on my word. Now, that's true, as far as I know, because I don't think he, and he says he never testified. So in his mind, he's not a rat. But, you know, we've heard this before. Johnny Monterano got up and testified against all these guys, and he said you can't rat on a rat. Monterano's a hitman who killed yeah, 20 I mean, people. So these guys, these guys love making excuses, right, but, what, but, but he, he, uh, is a, he is a rat. What, when you write stuff like that, though, are you concerned that you're perpetuating that street mentality um, of don't be a snitch, no, don't no, rat no, people No, 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 no. I'm pointing out the hypocrisy of these guys. That's their rules, not my rules. I'm not a gangster. Mm -hmm. Their rules are if you're a gangster, you don't talk about your friends. You do your time. You're, you're a stand-up guy. And one thing that's really important to, to you know, remember about the Whitey Bulger case is this is a case where people would go to the FBI to cooperate. There are several of the victims here were people who were cooperating with the FBI against Whitey. And, and there's one case where a realtor, a South Boston realtor, um, is summoned in by Whitey, and Whitey says, basically, I'm going to let you buy your life. You can pay me money or I'll kill you. And by the way, don't bother going to the FBI because I'll know in five minutes. Mm -hmm. and, and the word was, it was pretty clear on the street that Whitey had a pipeline to the FBI and, and people were afraid. So this wasn't just some, you know, do-gooder informant behind the scenes helping take down La Cosa Nostra. This was a guy who was, you know, paying off FBI agents. FBI agents were leaking him information and people were dying. So. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a whole different, this takes it to a whole new level. This isn't about not cooperating in, in murders or, you know, seeing something and not doing the right thing. And Tim, I just want to point out, I, really, I don't have a problem with Jay Carney at all. I think he's a great lawyer. And whatever my wise guy called him was Carney about. Carney being Bolger's lawyer. Yeah, right. I, you know, I have no, if I'm Jay Carney, I'm doing exactly what Jay Carney is doing. Yeah, so I've got no yeah. problem with him. Well, you know, we usually cover politics on this show, and Whitey gets very heavily involved in a way in the busing crisis in Boston in the 70s. People uh, in Rhode Island may not remember, but the, the order from the judge was to desegregate the schools and move people around. Either one of you could take, what, what, what was the reaction from Whitey? What did he do? I think Whitey saw himself as sort of the neighborhood's avenger, and he would go out there. And one of the things that Shelley and I show in the book, it's sort of, I think it's a uh, counterintuitive. A lot of people had always assumed Whitey kept everything on the down low. He did not want to draw any more attention to the town because that would affect his criminal business. But that's not what we found. We found that he really spent throughout busing, he was making symbolic attacks all over the place. He attacked a school very near the home of Judge Arthur Garrity, who was the person who imposed With busing. a Molotov cocktail. With a Molotov cocktail. And then on the second day of busing, the second year it began, Whitey was so angry that it didn't, you know, there was nothing, nothing happening. He, he took another Molotov cocktail. He drove out to the Jack Kennedy homestead on, in Brookline, the place where John F. Kennedy was born. And first he spray painted Bus Teddy, which was meaning Ted Kennedy, who was a big supporter of busing and a very big supporter of Judge Garrity. So he wrote Bus Teddy on the sidewalk. Then he went around and threw the bomb through the back and, and caused quite a bit of damage to uh, to Jack Kennedy's birthplace. And then the third attack he made that we, we pointed out was on the place that we call huh, Job. He attacked the Boston Globe right. with gunshots both in the front and then afterwards there was a lot of people put out front, police officers, guards, so the next day he drove around the other side on the expressway and fired that way. And in one of his letters, he's, he's quite proud of it. He really, really... He claims he's a job creator. Yeah, well, that's what he said. He, he had the, the job had to hire all these security <laughs> guys, put in all this new security <laughs> things. He, he bragged that these guys have since retired with full pensions. Shelley, with one minute left, that, that, the irony of that. I mean, here's a guy who got kicked out of every school that he ever went to practically. You know, he was... But here, he, he was... Uh, 
you know, caught up in busing, which is a whole education thing, something you were caught up with. You were bused to Dorchester. Yeah, what, yeah, and I do think that one thing that, you know, there was a feeling in South Boston that it was, that, that you know, it, there was really a violation of, of their rights, that people over there felt like, well, why can't I go to my school? Bus in whoever you want, but why do I have to be bused to another school? And I think people felt that there was a fundamental unfairness to the fact that, you know, the judge was ordering students to go to a school that had already been deemed inferior uh, and that if you were opposed to it, you were immediately branded a racist. Now, that's not to say there weren't racist people out there yelling Including and screaming white. and throwing <laughs> rocks at buses, but it's, but there was, a, there was a very good reason that people were opposed to busing, and, and it was unfair that if you were against it, you were branded a racist. And very, very briefly, 30 seconds, Kevin, the Globe up for sale by the New York Times Company. What's the move in the newsroom up there right now? Uh, some people are very nervous. Uh, a lot of uncertainty. You just don't know what's going to happen after with the new owner, but... Um, Maybe if they get, give Whitey all his money back, he could buy the Boston Globe. <laughs> now, that would be interesting. Publisher Whitey. All right, yes or no, is this thing going to trial? Absolutely. I, yeah, I believe it, it will go to trial. And there's concern about his health. He's locked up 23 hours a day. He has a heart issue. I, I think it's really important that they keep him healthy and get him to trial so that people can hear what he has to I say. I think he's too mean the, to die. Kevin he Cullen, Shelley Murphy, <laughs> the book is Whitey Bulger. It's fantastic. Pick it up. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.